Hello everybody, today I'd like to show off this thing that I designed about a week ago. I recently made a video on how to design cycloidal drives in Fusion 360, so the idea of cycloidal drives has really been ingrained in my mind for a little while. So I started thinking about what I could potentially do to improve on the traditional cycloidal drive design. So I came up with an idea for this. So I designed this really just to visualize it, just to see if it would actually work, and lo and behold it did work. I apologize in advance because when I start to turn this, the frame rate really drops because it's a somewhat complex mechanism. If I turn it slowly, you can see that we have two cycloidal disks here rotating in the same direction. And then you can also see that this top ring here, this ring, is rotating significantly slower than either of those two rings. So this design is difficult to convey, it's difficult to explain. I had a hard time even visualizing it. That's the reason I had to design it in the first place, because I couldn't figure out if it would work just in my head. So I had to actually put it into Fusion in order to see if it would actually do what I thought it would do. So what I have here is these two cycloidal disks. The one on the bottom, which you can't really see, has 10 lobes, and the one on the top has 9 lobes. So I wanted the disk on the bottom to be the main driver, so I have that one with these pins which would be fixed in your design and I wanted the top disc to rotate at the same speed as the bottom disc so I implemented these pins which you see here so each of the discs the top and the bottom one have two pins which are stuck inside of them and then two holes to correspond to the other one's pins so if you had four pins in the bottom and four holes in the top or vice versa one of them would be significantly lighter than the other, and it couldn't offset the center of mass, and you'd have a lot of vibration if you were rotating this at high speeds. So this compensates for that by always offsetting the center of mass. So both of them have two holes and have two pins, and they are offset by 90 degrees, so it's always the same no matter what. So then if you wanted to add more pins, you could, as long as they were in even numbers. You could have, for example, three holes in a triangular pattern on one, and then three pins in the opposite triangular pattern, which would then interface with three holes in the bottom one. But with this pin system, the top will always be rotating at the same speed as the bottom. And these holes are also significantly larger than they would be if you were just outputting into a normal output ring like you would with a standard cycloidal drive. This is because the eccentric gears that I have in here are offset 180 degrees. So this means that the center of mass of the bottom and the top discs are always offset 180 degrees. Again, this is to keep the center of mass of the entire system in the middle so that when you're going at high speeds, the whole system doesn't vibrate. And now mine here is not perfectly tuned. Since the bottom has 10 teeth, top has 9 teeth, naturally they would have different masses, although the top one can be scaled up a little bit in order to match the same cross-sectional area as the bottom. So just because the top has one less tooth than the bottom, it doesn't have to have less mass. It can be the same. And even though it's 9 and 10 teeth, the center mass of the individual disc will, of course, always be in the center. So the first disc engages with these fixed pins on the outside. And then the second disc engages with the first disc via these pins. And now this outer ring here, which has 10 pins, engages with this top disc here. So the pin system makes it so that the top disc is always at the same point in its rotation as the bottom one. What makes this confusing and interesting and potentially useful is that the top disc is rotating as if it were a 10-tooth lobe, but it only has 9 lobes. So then in order for this output ring with the 10 pins on it to keep up, it has to rotate very slowly around. So the gear reduction of the entire system of this top output ring here that has the 10 pins on it ends up being the number of lobes on the bottom times the number of lobes on the top. So I've got 10 here and then 9 here. So the output rotation ends up being a 90 to 1 reduction. So every 90 rotations I make on this input eccentric gear here, the top ring rotates once. Unfortunately, I'm still not totally sure how this all works. Because it's not just as simple as the top times the bottom. It's more complicated than that. So in this case, it is just top times the bottom. It is 9 times 10, 90. But if you had a 10 on the top and a 10 on the bottom, they would cancel each other out. So what I think is essentially happening is the output on the first disc is rotating at one-tenth the speed, let's say clockwise. 
And then the output on the second disk, since it's already rotating at the speed of the first one, is going in the opposite direction. So if your top disk had 10 lobes and your bottom had also had 10 lobes, then both of them would just cancel each other out. And the bottom would try to move clockwise at one-tenth the original speed, and the top would try to move counterclockwise one-tenth the original speed, and then you'd get a net of zero movement. But when your top disk has one less lobe than your bottom disk, it's not quite fast enough to keep up, so that it ends up being that multiplication of the top times the bottom, which of course makes it more difficult to balance it since you need to scale the top one in order to have the same area as the bottom one, but it should still be possible. So if you could take this system from the digital world and make it real, it would be significantly better than a standard cycloidal drive system. Generally, when you're using a cycloidal drive, you want a really high gear reduction for a small footprint. And this offers that significantly more than a standard cycloidal drive system. So normally, if I wanted a 90 to 1 reduction, I would have to have a 92 cycloidal gear. And since I don't want my system to vibrate, I'd have to have another 92 cycloidal gear on top of that, offset 180 degrees, so that the center of mass is always in the middle. So in the end, if I wanted a 90 to 1, I need two 92 cycloidal gears. But with this system, it is significantly reduced. Since it's essentially taking a gear reduction on the input and the output, you don't need any more gears, you can just shrink them both down. So instead of having two 92 gears, I can just have a 10 and a 9. And I can make it so that they have the same mass and they cancel each other out, so no vibration in the system. So you can make a gearbox like this with the same reduction as a standard 90 to 1, except it would be 1 9th the diameter, which makes it 1 81st of the cross-sectional area, and all still in the same depth. It's still just two gears deep. Granted, this system does have more issues with tolerance, since you would need a higher tolerance, at least hypothetically, in order to maintain the constant contact between this output ring and the second cycloidal disc. But if you could achieve that tolerance, then it would be a significantly better system, achieving an extremely high gear reduction in a minuscule area. Or if size is not your only concern, and instead strength is your concern, you could keep it the same size, but then significantly increase the width of your gear profile or the thickness of your pins in order to allow your gearbox to withstand a significantly higher torque. So I'm not totally sure what to call this. I have just been referring to it as a two-stage cycloidal drive, although it is significantly weirder than just that. As far as I know, this isn't a thing. I've never seen anything like this, so... Uh, maybe someone's made this before me, but I'm not sure. I wouldn't necessarily know. By my perception, this seems pretty novel, but I'm not a mechanical engineer by any means, so I wouldn't know. So I wanted just to show this off a little bit and explain how I think it works. I'd love to hear anyone else's thoughts on it, specifically on ways you can prove it, or just for a better explanation on how it works in general. Like I said, I really am not totally sure how this works. So I'd love to hear what people think about this system, but that's all I have for now, so 